Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Dette er den ukentlige nyhetssendingen fra Europa. Every day. They used to business Sitting there for magic potions Destroying me friends Stealing his world Okay, um, now I suppose we're coming to the second part of our show um, and I have to say that uh, we've uh, all the all the sort of interviews kind of connect up and we're going to be now covering something that the uh, newspapers aren't covering, although they're covering the story about the actual uh, fires uh, in Alaska and Canada, 12 million acres uh, being destroyed this year. Um, and basically we're, we're, we're sort of going to be looking at the social uh, impacts uh, and in specifically we'll be going to uh, First Nations uh, tribe, uh, the Denny, uh, for an interview with Candice Paul. Um, and I think we'll just go straight into that. Is that fair enough, Jimmy? No, that's perfectly okay, Sean. See you back here. In about, what, 38 minutes or thereabouts? Uh, uh, 30, I think, it's, yeah. Okay. All right, so welcome to European News Weekly. We have another interview uh, with a very fascinating guest, uh, um, and that is uh, basically Candice uh, Paul, and uh, she's from the English River First Nations, and uh, she's here to talk to us today, uh, uh, amongst other things possibly, if we get time, but certainly uh, to highlight the issue that's happened uh, in Canada and Alaska with uh, 12 million acres uh, of uh, forest just being uh, burnt down, uh, an incredibly large amount, uh, historic uh, sort of uh, large amount of forest that has disappeared. Uh, and of course there were people living in these forests and uh, Candice is, uh, and her colleagues uh, her tribal uh, fellows and uh, neighbours uh, were all affected uh, by this fire in one way or other. Um, and I think there was about uh, 13,000 people in Candice's area uh, were affected. And um, I'd like, just like to uh, uh, first off uh, introduce uh, Candice. Welcome to uh, New European News Weekly with myself, uh, Jimmy, uh, myself, Sean McGee and Jimmy Hagan. Um, uh, welcome to uh, European News. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Jimmy. All right. And um, I think I'll just start off with uh, just a, a, a brief question. Uh, we, we have some, a few questions to ask, but uh, concerning the pollution, um, uh, just wondering from these fires, just being one issue, uh, uh, has that had any effect on uh, people's health uh, or uh, quality uh, of uh, life while that's, with all this uh, uh, sort of forest fires going up in smoke? Oh, definitely. I mean, the air was so thick that, you know, you couldn't see 200 meters at times. It, there was ash in the air all the time. Uh, you had to keep your windows and doors closed. Even when you're driving down the road, you'd have to, you know, just recirculate the interior air in the vehicle. It was bad, really bad in some of the communities that the fires got within, you know, close, uh, within a couple of kilometers of, and there was actually a couple of communities that lost houses. So it was really quite bad. There was live embers falling on houses. Um, a lot of the people that had to be evacuated, like that was a third of the population of northern Saskatchewan, 13,000 people. And um, it was mostly because of the smoke. The smoke was just really hard for anyone with respiratory problems, children. A lot of the evacuees were small ch people with small children, and elders, people with cardiopulmonary issues. Um, and then in general, like for the large, for the, some of the large communities that uh, the fire got close to, they had to, they had to leave. But the entire north, and actually the entire of Saskatchewan, was impacted by the air quality. I actually had to make a trip to uh, I had to make a trip to Saskatoon, which is like 500 kilometers south of us, and it was it was smokier there than people have ever experienced in their lifetimes. And it all the way down to Regina, Saskatchewan, and actually the smoke was actually all the way down to Kansas in the United States. Yeah, and all east to Labrador in Canada, which is like a long, hell of a long ways. So, like, just the burning of those forests, plus 
like, you know, there's the, we also have concerns that because of the uh, uranium mining in Saskatchewan, in northern Saskatchewan up here, that some of the trees, plants, etc., have uh, accumulated radionuclides. And once those forests and plants burn, those could be floating on the air as well. Right, that's a very interesting point you bring up because there's a lot of mining going uh, in and around that area, isn't there? Right, and there's a lot, and there's, there's, there's a lot of questionable uh, monitoring and stuff that doesn't get reported kind of thing. Right. There, and, my, mines didn't actually get impacted by the fire too much. So it's but it's pollution travels though, doesn't we it? We do know that radionuclides travel a long ways from the mine. So. Especially in the, through via the water and up through the roots, I suppose. Yeah. So, I mean, um, just coming back to the, the effects uh, on the people, which, you know, we're, we're getting no reports on this on the mainstream at all. So, um, basically, the uh, emergency services, the governments, uh, have, have they helped the First Nations people and, and, and the neighbours, the non-First Nations people? Uh, uh, has a, uh, could you describe the sort of support you had or whether you had to uh, do some sort of uh, your, your own uh, support? Uh, well, it? they did actually go into action fairly quickly, um, but it was mostly through, well, I guess, wildfire, wildfire management and emergency social services and then the Red Cross. And so I think, though, the worst part was at the beginning, there was no preparation in the communities. Communities didn't know what was expected to be done, what could be done, what the process was. So there was no pre-planning of emergency types of this of this magnitude. So that was that was kind of a big problem, and communications was also a bit of a problem. Uh, when our, within our own community, we got on it early. We figured out a plan, and we got the information we needed to inform people and keep people informed, which made a huge difference. Some people, you know, in some of the communities left in a panic because they just didn't know how close it was or that sort of thing. Um, and you couldn't tell where the fires were. It was so smoky, you know. It, it, there just wasn't enough communications. And with all the smoke, it was really hard for wildfire management to actually spot some of the fires. So it was... Uh, there was that problem, but Red Cross stepped in and sent transport vehicles to help people who don't have vehicles get out of the communities and people who didn't have gas, because, like, who plans for this, right? And some of the communities didn't even have enough gas in the community to mobilize the entire community. So that was, that was part of what they did. But uh, we've heard good things and we've heard bad things from evacuees. Some of the communities where people were evacuated to were well, people were happy, they were well taken care of. Um, it seemed like the farther south you went, uh, more iffy it was. There was a lot of people who got really stressed. You know, you're moving a whole community and you've got all manners of people within those communities. And, you know, you've got people with health issues, you've got people with small kids, you know, you've got people with addictions, you've got elders that need certain... So there's all kinds of people that need to be taken care of, and you've got them in a very small, confined space. Mm -hmm. So you got, like, 3,000 people at, that you're housing in three different places in a city, which is a lot. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of people also had family members that they went to stay with stuff, and they were fine. And they were able, they were also supported with um, food vouchers and things like that, oh, and gas, to get, gas to get back home and that sort of thing. Um, the one, there was just kind of like it was really, really stressful for the amount of time that people were out. So it, it got even more stressful and not knowing what's going on in your home and for people who had pets that left behind and so forth, it, you know, it was, it was very, very stressful. I was receiving calls all the time from, from evacuees like, what's it like? We want to come home. What's it like? And I'd have to say, no, not yet. Don't do it because your you know your community's not out of the woods yet. But what's the uh, time frame there, Candy? Sorry for interrupting. Well, some people were out for nearly two weeks, three weeks. So that's quite a long time to be, you know, in a crowded situation, and you know where you're a large group. And there's also a bit of trauma involved because a lot of the people, First Nations people, had to go to residential school. I'm sure you've heard of that. And uh, it was all dorm situations, and this was just like a total reminder of that because everybody is squashed together like they were then, you know. So there's. And then you're talking about people that had actually been in the schools. Yes. Um, wow. So that so was quite true. There were two triggers there, and it wasn't well understood by by the caregivers. Um, 
So what happened uh, is that some of the reserves in the southern part of the province, middle part of the province, stepped up and they started taking smaller groups of up to 100 people and taking them into their reserves and providing them with everything they needed. Everything that was offered by the Red Cross was also offered by the what we call the Res, res Crosses, only it was more culturally appropriate. They fed them culturally appropriate foods and looked after people in, in a more understanding way. All right, that's really good. So, that, so sorry, go on. And that was something that we wanted to see starting to happen with a lot of these disasters that have happened. We've noted that, you know, when non-First Nations communities are impacted, they get a lot of support. The First Nations communities are in a different government jurisdiction and they get different kind of support. Really? And it's First Nations communities that lost houses and it's, you know, I don't know if the government's going to step up and buy new houses right away for them. Because we know, like, in places like, Man like Manitoba, where a First Nation was flooded out, four years later, those people are still in the hotels. So we don't want to see something like that happen. And that's why we've, you know, been advocating for something like the Res Cross. So we have emergency response teams of our own as well. Do, do you think you can get uh, money from uh, some sort of UN or, or whatever to, to help you with that? I don't know about the UN, but they were getting donations from all kinds of people. It, it don't, people were stepping up and donating that hadn't been happy with uh, the Red Cross's response because they turned down donations and they threw away people's traditional foods and things like that. Oh dear. All right. Because they we because they have to follow, you know, all of the regulations and stuff. That's why. But it's, you know, unfortunate that they have to do that when people are in a stress situation, traditional foods are going to comfort them, you know? Um, just just coming on to traditional foods now, uh, I think there's going to be kind of a double impact there. You know, as you say, it's amazing what you're saying about having a res cross. Uh, you know, that's a reservation cross you're on about. So. Well, yeah, we call it reserves here. Sure, sure. Just, just clarifying for uh, our uh, listeners. Um, and and it, it's very much a case that you, you, we were talking just before the uh, the show, and you mentioned uh, the some of the good points uh, that, that that occurred, um, which uh, are that there were very few uh, deaths and injuries that that one might expect, and you also talked about uh, the ecology. And I was just wondering, uh, you know, to, to do with the rejuvenation of the forest, although, um, you know, it's a bit a natural thing, but this is obviously a bit larger. Um, so so could, could you possibly talk about, about those two aspects? I know they're two separate. Sure. sure. Um, the forest does need to, it needs fire to rejuvenate. Pine trees need that for their cones to pop open and drop seeds. And it is a natural occurrence. The government itself, though, has had a let it burn policy for the last decade in Saskatchewan. And that's fine on a normal year. You know, it's no, there's not a whole lot of point of putting a, whole, a lot of crews on putting out fires in, in where it's not going to affect much. But on a year where we haven't seen any precipitation hardly at all since July last year uh, and hardly any snowfall over the year, um, that was inappropriate and you could see it coming. A lot of northerners knew that we were in for a bad fire situation and that was understood by the northern people very well. However, the government of Saskatchewan didn't alter its policies and I know that one of the largest communities that needed to be evacuated, the fires started there four days before they made a decision to move on it and then they decided they didn't have any equipment to move on it so it was another four days before they got uh, equipment and with the dry dry conditions that we had that fire was out of control and way beyond capacity and they're still fighting that one um, so that's the kind of thing that the government did not address because of global warming that's happening which the government of Saskatchewan is a big part of with oil development and Canada in general is a big part of it because tar sands is both you know right next to us and they're looking at developing more tar sands here. Um, Saskatchewan has one of the biggest per capita uh, emissions in the world which is ridiculous so we need to start preparing on how we're going to handle that and Saskatchewan government did not do with it. So um, there was inadequate amount of uh, uh, equipment to deal with it, like there was not enough hoses, there was not enough pumps, there was not enough water trucks, there was not enough to deal with the numbers of fires and the, and the size of the fires. 
so that's why things got really out of control. I don't know if the smoke hadn't hit southern Saskatchewan, whether they'd have moved on it hardly at all. You know, it's and, and the fact that people had to come to southern Saskatchewan to be evacuated. Uh, the impact it's going to have on people now is that because of the size of these fires, we've lost a lot of our traditional foods for the next few years. Um, I don't know how long it will take and how many animals we've lost. Northern Saskatchewan people, First Nations people in general up here still eat traditional foods. They hunt. And now that's going to be diminished greatly. We'd have to range a whole lot farther to be able to hunt. Um, in the next few years, like within two, three years, we'll have an abundance of blueberries and mushrooms, but, you know, that's going to take time. This year is what's really going to hurt, and the big meat animals like moose, deer, um, maybe some caribou are really impacted. And trappers will be impacted, you know, like the economy of the trapping life is going to be impacted again. A lot of those small animals will not be available. Right, that's... Uh... Fantastic stuff. Uh, it's, just, it's a very good report, and um, I must I must thank you for for, for the uh, totality of it. You, you've been uh, keeping a, a, a track of the daily day by day uh, sort of events. Uh, I noticed on Facebook. Uh, I think it's First Nations Say Enough. Yes, um, I have a part. I as a volunteer for for our community, I'm involved in uh, receiving updates from wildfire management and I felt it was important that all communities were able to get that information as quickly as possible. Sure. And um, just in the aftermath, obviously people are starting to return home now and as you said, there was, there was some, uh, there has been some good news on the, on the front that, that, that uh, injuries and, and deaths of, uh, and even damaged property has been minimized to a degree, um, uh, you know, considering the size of the fires. Um, so, I mean, what uh, what what is your community? Uh, how, how does your community deal with the after effects? Uh, I, I noticed that um, there was some uh, ceremonies that were being done um, in order to uh, help help the community um, sort of deal with the trauma and stress that they've been through. Um, can can you talk about that at all? Well, I think like for some of the communities, it's going to be people will be going and taking a look at their new landscape. Nothing looks the same. Nothing is the same. Things are burnt right down to the sand. You'll see some black charred um, tree trunks. And I think that the community members, some of us are going to be going out to, to our, our former traditional homes and going out and offering our, our tobacco and asking for healing of this land and quick rejuvenation. Um, for some people, it's going to be really hard. They lost their traditional home. They lost uh, portages along their, their river highways. We still use the river systems as, as highways up here. Um, they lost, you know, a lot of memories with their families, where their families have always been. So, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be traumatic for a lot of people. Sure. So, so although there may not be physical injuries, there's certainly uh, mental, spiritual injuries. Uh, should we say? Yeah, there will be. Right. Well, uh, I, I, yeah. That's. Uh, I can only hope uh, the best for for, for uh, your people and and uh, all the other people that have been affected by this uh, in a similar way. And uh, mm -hmm. I hope getting the information out can help you you know prepare for the next time and try and to get the people housed uh, which is a very big problem we see all around the world uh, people being made homeless and being left uh, in in uh, in the lurch so um but what i would say is uh, J jimmy have you have you got any questions uh, well yeah um i think as candice was uh, was relaying the changes in in the landscape there and I, I imagine, like, uh, the animal vets must have been uh, of a significant scale, and, and because of the lack of forest now, it's going to be a long, long time before uh, the, the, the ecology of, of the environment recovers, like, uh, the animals' homes basically have lost, and not only have they been killed, but they've got nowhere to return to, uh, they have no safe environment to return to, and, and also I'd imagine, like, with the amount of timber that was burnt, I imagine y your resources for building new homes are now up in smoke also. 
Exactly. We had actually been working on alternative housing plans in the north because traditional stick-built houses with lumber are expensive and people can't really afford them. And we wanted to foster independence. And now in some of those places where we were working on those plans, you know, all the good timber is gone. So, you know, well, that, I'm really grateful that right where we live, it's not because we were in the process of trying to build a log house. You know? But for a lot of people, that that lost cabins too that those aren't just like vacation cabins those are seasonal homes for people here um, because we do still have kind of a nomadic lifestyle throughout the year so now they're going to be really hard put to replace those because they're going to have to travel far and haul things it's not going to be uh, as simple as it would have been normally you know uh, do you have any sort of GoFundMe or is there any sort of central authority trying to, to, to get funding? Uh, I, I noticed that individuals are putting up uh, GoFundMe accounts to, to help build a house, and uh, uh, but, but uh, that's for activism. But uh, is there a similar one for, for people that have been made homeless? I've seen that in the Montreal Lake, which is one of the uh, reserves that lost, I think, seven or I think it was seven houses. Um, 40 people are without homes now. So there is a GoFundMe campaign for that one. I'd have to send you the coordinates for that because I don't have it with me. Um, but uh, I'll get that to you because I think that would be really useful because if we depend on government in Canada, especially the federal government, which is what takes care of First Nations funding, um, they'll be waiting a long time. So and it would be really crap. Really housing they first get, I'm sure. Is there a, so there's a lot of uh, bureaucracy uh, with uh, funding with First Nations peoples generally, do you think? Oh, God. <laughs> That's an understatement. Okay. <laughs> uh, the government, and, and especially with housing, has been underfunding reserves in, in Canada for 30, 40 years. They haven't changed the amount of funding that people get, and we're the fastest growing population in the country. So it's. Uh, can I ask what, what sort of support you've um, had from other First Nation tribes uh, around North America? Um, it, it, has it just been Canadians dealing with it, or, or uh, have uh, uh, Canadian tribes further south that have, you know um, have they been? Uh, not sorry, the American tribes uh, or even South American tribes. Uh, have you had any support from Indigenous peoples? Uh, Elsewhere. I haven't heard of any, but that doesn't mean it didn't exist. Sure. So maybe maybe some of the reserves that started to help with um, um, the Res Cross mm -hmm. uh, concept got some help. I couldn't really say. Okay. So it'd be an interesting uh, uh, development, I think, uh, maybe for the future. Yes. Something worth expanding on. So. Um, uh, right. I'd, I'd, I'd like to sort of ask, coming away from the, this uh, important topic, about yourself and your husband uh, and, and the activism that you both do and, um, you know, the successes that you've had or is, is, there, any, is there anything you'd like to say about that to, to our viewers? Well, mostly we've been involved in uh, uranium and nuclear issues because Saskatchewan is uh, the one place in Canada right now, it's the only place in Canada right now that has uranium mining. And um, it was also targeted for high-level nuclear waste uh, repository. Because of the work that our committee has done, our Committee for Future Generations, we eliminated Saskatchewan from, from, from storing nuclear waste. So we've, we've had a good uh, amount of success with that. We'd like to really push for success with making people more aware of what harm is coming to our, our peoples, our land, our waters because of the uranium mining. There's been no health studies on the people, but we have soaring cancer rates. And we know that our food is being, our food supply, our traditional food supply, is being impacted by uh, the uranium mining. There's radionuclides in our meat. We're told that it's safe to eat. But they didn't tell us when they first discovered this. And because of a high school student doing a report and doing some research, that's how it was discovered that there was, we have been eating radionuclides in our meat. So what we've had to do already, like for ourselves, is quit hunting in, in anywhere near our traditional hunting grounds. Because that's where our, our traditional hunting grounds are where the mines are. 
Right. There's oh. problems, I think, in, uh, was it Romania or Bulgaria, uh, uh, where uh, very radioactive mushrooms uh, from uh, near uh, uranium mines were, were uh, stopped in Germany, you know, crossing Europe. Uh, yeah. So this, uh, that, that's obviously a, a food that uh, the deer and moose eat, I presume. Uh, um, so. Not mushrooms. Bears will eat those. <laughs> no, that's fine. But, yeah, it, it's like... It's if it's in the water, if it's in the lichens, if it's in that, it's getting to all of the animals, and particularly the organ meat, which we eat. So they said if we don't eat it every day, you know, it'll be okay, except we eat it every day. Of course. Well, yeah. Um, and and is, is that, what's the monitoring of the, of the uh, deer meat um, for contaminants? Um, how, how much do you think... Um, uh, how much is being done? I mean, like Canada aren't exactly well known for being uh, honest with uh, with the contamination in food situations. I'm, I'm talking about the salmon at the moment, uh, the exactly. farm, farm right. salmon. You know. They are, Canada over the last several years, but Canada's been involved in the nuclear industry forever in a day. The, uh, the first, the, the first uranium for the nuclear or the atomic bombs was from Canada, the Northwest Territories. And all the miners that mine that they used, the Dene miners from up north there, all died. And, and the, it was up the Dene with, uh, tribe is obviously your tribe as well. That's cool. Yeah, and it was up to them to prove it. And it is always up to the people to prove that there's a problem because of the radionuclides. Because the regulatory board is a farce. They are so pro propaganda nuclear. It just it just it just reeks. So what what we've had to do is start. Uh, we're, we've been, we're in the process of doing our own monitoring, learning how to do it properly so it can't be discredited. Uh, we're in the process of trying to get a health study of some sort going, and uh, so that we can prove. But right now, like you know, they're using our young people as labor for the mines, and they've actually kept the north pretty isolated in terms of other economic development. So keeps, all there is is mines, you know. So it keep, keeps keeps you reliant on mines, and that's the kind of thing they were doing in Fukushima and in Germany. Uh, sorry, in Japan, where where the main industry would be the nuclear industry. And uh, exactly. yeah. so right, so so basically, you've got you've got that situation, and uh, uh, <laughs> and then on top of that, you're saying about t tar sands as well. Exactly. So. Um, there's over 2,700 mineral claims north north of us here in our territory, in all of it in Dennis Hussaini territory. And it's mostly uranium. There's some tar sands on the northwest side that they want to develop, but right now it's so expensive, uh, and the oil industry is pretty much tanked at the moment that they've they've stopped progress. But they're, the government announced that they're looking for new ways to make it be happen, be able to happen more cheaply. So they're putting some money into research for that. Um, and then if they do get that developed, they want to use small nuclear reactors, small modular nuclear reactors to power those mines. And so uh, what, that what, what, case, what, we would end up with nuclear waste all over again. Yeah, no, totally. So, so a little reminder, a little, a little reminder folks, and uh, sorry to interrupt you, Candice, but uh, we're on the, uh, uh, we're on the near, near enough to three minute left mark. So um, I just wanted to give you a little heads up if there was anything important that you wanted to uh, links or, or, or to important information or places where people can go to help and, and maybe donate a, little, a few quid or... Um, well, do you have a uh, do you have a way I can get the uh, GoFundMe campaign for the people who've lost cabins? Yeah, we can put that onto our European News dot WordPress dot com website, uh, and of course we'll uh, we will have just uh, pointed everybody towards that. So. Okay, because um, I don't have it with me. If people want information on what's going on in northern Saskatchewan and how this is continuing to impact people, uh, what it does is actually these fires have also cleared the way for industry because what there is kind of going on is kind of a scorched earth policy. What they won't call, they won't admit there's a policy as like that. But uh, if people want to find out what's going on. Uh, we have Facebook pages called First Nations Say Enough and Say No to Nuclear Waste in Northern, Say No to Nuclear in Northern Saskatchewan. And we also have Committee for Future Generations .wordpress .com. 
So that's our main ways of communicating with people around the world is we have these pages. And if uh, people can make donations to the work that we do, um, we have we can be contacted by going to our email, which is committee for future generations at gmail.com. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, well, we've given people the, the, those details. And Candice, all I can say is, look, thank you so much for coming and talking about this quite quite uh, harsh uh, topic. Uh, I, I'm glad that people haven't been hurt, but um, I'm sad that people are, uh, are, uh, are left with uh, sort of a desolation and uh, stress. So um, thank you so much for coming along and, and letting the world know uh, what the mainstream media doesn't want you want them to know. Um, we hope to get it out there and pass it round. And uh, uh, got, I really wish you luck for the future. And I do hope you're going to come back. Um, we, we have uh, you have a lot of topics uh, and uh, activities that you're involved with, and uh, in and uh, well, it's uh, topics that are very near and dear to us. So I look forward to that. Excellent, thank you, Candice. Uh, Jimmy, over to you, my friend. Yeah, thank you very, very much, Candice. It's been great to get some first-hand knowledge from within the area of of, of of how people are being affected by the fires. Like we're we're getting sparse reports, I guess, and we're depending, I suppose, on on the bloggers and the uh, the independent scientists to actually give us uh, some information. So it's been great having you on. Thanks very much. You're welcome. And uh, again, thank you very, very much, Candice Paul. That was uh, that was brilliant. Uh, Sean, you enjoy that? Well, that, that was just a it's really, a really compelling uh, testimony. Uh, it's a really compelling report, I would say, mm. of what's happened and, uh, and and a good overview of the situations that the uh, Dene uh, First Nations people of uh, and others um, have sort of have to deal with, uh, you know, over the years, uh, not just now. <coughs> so. Uh, Right, well, I, I think we'll, we'll have to push ahead. We will, we'll yeah. Get the show finished. Uh, yeah. It's an absolutely amazing show. Uh, the, 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 the levels of testimony that the media are, are not uh, getting out there to the people is, is, is amazing. And uh, I, I don't know about you, but I'm completely surprised about the stuff we're, we're, uh, we're, we're getting hold of and the, the things we're reporting, you know. Yeah, well, it's, it's great to have the opportunity to... to, to actually discuss stuff that uh, nobody else is discussing really too much so uh, <laughs> it's 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 quite intriguing really yeah no no absolutely absolutely um but a very emotive uh, uh sort of interview that um you know you, you can't help but feeling uh feeling some compassion for their situation you know overall indeed uh but we feel blessed though that we, we we're having uh, people coming forward from first nations as well coming on to the show and uh, and sure. uh, and sharing their their wisdom i guess i think it's great and even though it was a tough topic but uh, i do look forward to hearing from candice again mm, absolutely know, yeah it. Right, well, uh, we'll have a little change of pace now, uh, yeah. but although it is connected uh, with the situation uh, that Candice and her people are facing, uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll go, I think, straight into the um, sort of extinction report with Kevin. Uh, sound good to you, Jimmy? Indeed, we have <laughs> another rerun of our extinction report. It's great. So, Kevin Hester. Right, okay, so um, after our interview with uh, Candice Paul uh, from the First Nations in uh, uh, Saskatchewan, um, we're just coming over now to the Extinction Report with uh, Kevin Hester. Um, we're going to discuss uh, uh, the, some of the scientific uh, uh, sort of uh, details behind the fires, uh, and we're probably uh, going to uh, throw some posits out there for people uh, concerning uh, the effects of those fires, possibly in Norway, I believe. Uh, but uh, Kevin has the details for that. So uh, well, welcome once again to uh, to the uh, European News. Uh, version of the uh, Extinction Report, our, uh, our very own Kevin Hester. Welcome. Hello, it's great to be back again. Yes, it's interesting this fire situation that you were talking about has, is really getting worse and worse literally by the day. There are massive fires burning in the Northern Territories of Canada at the moment. There's one fire in the Birch Creek Fire Complex which is 25, two, sorry, 250,000 acres on its own. So far this year up there, there's been 186 wildfires and 156 of them are burning as we speak. This rate of burning is unprecedented in the last 10,000 years. If that doesn't worry people, they're not paying attention. This is extraordinary. 30% of the, the, the combined boreal forests of Canada, Europe, Russia and Alaska account for 30% of the world's carbon which is stored on land. 
and all of it is under attack. It is just incredible. And then there, there are all these positive feedback loops that come from it with soot being do dropped on the polar ice caps, lowering the albedo, speeding up the melt. It's just an incredible situation. So, Kevin, we're hearing some interesting figures coming through about the uh, the actual scale of the fires and uh, compared to uh, the the ten year and uh, twenty five year averages. Do you would you like to put some of that in perspective for us? Yes, so that the the amount of acres burned in the Northwest Territories is six times the twenty five year average. You know, this is. This is not this is not a small increase or a large increase. This is an exponential increase, and in the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change, in their in their data, they have made no allowances or no significant allowances for the carbon that is being released from these massive forests that are burning. And you've got to remember that before they burned, they were car they were carbon sequesters. So we've gone from them working to help us with our carbon problem to them contributing to it. And when you listen to the scale of those statistics that I've just given you, you realise that it's another it's another time where you see the exponential uh, factor coming into into play, and where you, where you see the, these tipping points being triggered all the time. Astounding. So, uh, in terms of, so I mean, basically, there was another story that you came up with, uh, and we were, we were talking with Candice about the fact that that the pollution air quality was very poor in Saskatchewan. Now they've had rain, and fortunately, some areas are uh, are certainly uh, the the fires are being put out and uh, they're receding. Um, although I think the area you mentioned is still a bit of a problem. Um, but uh, obviously, further down down the uh, jet stream, where some some of this has gone. Some of it's just headed uh, sort of uh, east, I believe, uh, but uh, some of it headed uh, south towards uh, America on the jet stream and has caused pollution further there. But interestingly enough, you mentioned about Norway uh, and, and massive flooding there. C can you Have you got any details on that? No, well, no, I haven't got any more on that at the moment, I'm sorry. Sure. All right. Well, the, the fact that, it, that you picked that up, though, is uh, very interesting because uh, obviously what we would we'll be seeing um, is uh, with the flights that fly along the jet stream to Europe um, and the pollution that, from these fires, um, with the, the actual particles themselves cause the raindrops to get bigger. Uh, so when they hit land, instead of just gently uh, dropping and then carrying on across Europe, they tend to get to the west coast of Europe and then dump the rain uh, in one big hit. And uh, that's obviously happening in Norway. So if if that is the case, then we, we are seeing effects, further effects, uh, in, including contrails from airplanes, two and a half million airplanes, plus a, an unknown number of military aircraft coming over to Europe as well for various reasons. Um, and that all these added up together are, are causing incredible I mean we, we, we're getting half the temperature in Ireland that we would get uh, if we were in Paris um, and we've got complete cloud cover all the time and rain we're, you know we're getting hit just on the edge by this rain that's heading up to Norway well I actually have a so, little bit of detail on that Sean if you if you want to hear the, sure. the how and the where so so basically experts baffled by freak downpour in Norway and this happened last Monday and uh, experts and meteorologists are saying this is the sort of thing that only happens in a tropical downpour. So basically the onslaught came on suddenly and uh, it happened in the village of Trondheim and uh, basically what happened was 102 millimetres of rain came down in the space of an hour. So that's just uh, the basics of it. And that's, that's the kind of uh, rainfall you get when you get large you know, particulates that are causing larger raindrops, uh, and uh, they're, they're much heavier. And when they when they do fall, they can fall in very small areas. You know, certain clouds have got more pollution than others. Um, so that that's yeah, that's that's a really good uh, uh, pick up there, uh, Jim. Uh, sorry, anyway, what look you, back to you, Kevin. Have you got any other? What, yeah, well, what you have to remember about uh, our heating atmosphere is that for every degree of heating we have, we get another seven percent of moisture in the atmosphere. So the storms that we're going to be seeing will be more ferocious and the deluges that we get from them will be uh, a hell of a lot more rain. You know, we're looking at, at four and five and six degrees C temperature increase in the coming decades probably. And that's going to, that's going to be something like 30 or 35, 40 percent more moisture in the atmosphere. Can you imagine every statistical hundred year flood that anyone's ever heard of before will be gone in no time flat. 
an, a very interesting paper that's come out um, just recently. The International Business Times have done a, a an article about a, a a paper that's just been re released in the in the journals from a, a professor called John Sharamsky of the University of Georgia, where he said our planet will become less and less hospitable as a result of plant loss if we don't go extinct. Our lifestyles will revert to those of our ancestors 12,000 years ago. This is a journal paper. This isn't the article is referring to a journal paper, and it, um, the the heading of the article is "Humans face extinction if plant destruction continues. The laws of thermodynamics have no mercy." Wow, that's quite a quite a cry for help, isn't it? You know, course, Absolutely, and you know this is pure science. You know this isn't speculation. Uh, this is all peer reviewed. I take it. Yeah. It says the research estimate that the planet contained around a thousand billion t tons of carbon 2,000 years ago, and now there is half of that, and it is thought we've destroyed 10% of that bank of carbon in the last hundred years. So it accumulated over a thousand billion. Sorry, it accumulated over 2,000 years, and in a hundred we have we have um, taken out 10%. It's just the statistics are just mind-boggling. I mean, that's quite uh, that's quite interesting, Kevin. Because also, uh, I'm I'm going to quote from a, a Guardian article there during the week. Also, and uh, a panel of scientists, 413 from 58 countries, um, and and they put out a report, the state of the climate in 2014, and and they're saying based on research from these scientists, they found record warming on the surface and upper levels of the oceans, especially in the North Pacific, in line with earlier findings uh, of 2014 as the hottest year on record. Yeah, uh, we, this June. This June was the hottest June we've ever had, and it looks like that this year will be the hottest year we've ever had. There's no That's turning back from here. New Zealand, Kevin. No, no. Globally, it was the hottest. Oh, globally. June. Wow. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, is there anything else you'd like to finish up with, uh, Kevin? We're coming near to the end of our uh, our session. Yeah, I'd just like to have one more talk about the drought in South America, where it's incredible. In, in Sao Paulo, they have been turning sludge into drinking water. It's unbelievable. They've, been, they've set up pumps at the, at, the, at, the, at the bottom of their drained um, lake system, and they've been pumping up the mud and filtering it and taking the water out of it. That's how desperate the situation has been in Sao Paulo. There are 160,000 um, residents and businesses that have their water turned off for 48 hours at a time, and then it only comes back on for 24 hours. We did pick up on that Sao Paulo story like uh, several months ago, and I did notice that article coming out there during the week. So it's quite astounding to see uh, the results of what's going on several months down the road. Uh, information has been sparse, of course, in the meantime about Sao Paulo, but uh, interesting to see how things are developing there for sure. Oh, it's unbelievable, and and there's no, you know there's no no prospect of more water coming, and they're already at the end of it. It's extraordinary. Well, I think Candice was telling us that there was, uh, what's it? It was been over a year since they've had rain, uh, and that's why they've had the wildfires. But now, now, thank heavens, it's just started to rain, but, but uh, a little bit late in the coming. Yes, but you know, when you're living on water as a promissory note, you know you're in trouble, don't you? Indeed, sure. indeed. So we're running out of time here, guys, and we're at uh, we're eleven and a half minutes in. Um, I was hoping, Kevin, that you might touch on the. Uh, on, on the big Greek story, because um, while everybody's been watching the uh, the financial crisis unfold, uh, you filled us on on an interesting piece of of information about Athens there. Oh, about the the fires in Athens. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. If if anyone, if you have a look, um, I haven't got the the paper in front of me at the moment, but I, I've seen photos in the last day or so where there's been massive forest fires on the hills above Athens. And the smoke is pouring across the city. This, people have already have died from uh, respiratory problems from it. There are four main the four main fronts of 34 separate fires. Then a lot of it is on the island of Evia, northeast of Athens. It's poor old Greece, you know, as if they didn't have enough bearing down on them without climate change exacerbating the problems that they've got. It's hard to it's hard to see it as anything else other than biblical and apocalyptic in a sense, really, isn't it? What's going on at the minute? It's like the perfect storm, man. When things go wrong, you know, on on yachts we used to call it a cascade of events, where one thing happens and then there's a domino effect and and things fall apart. And these things are all linked, you know. 
climate change is a driver between a whole lot of social unrest in lots of different places. In the Middle East, it's, it was one of the things that created a lot of the dissension amongst the people before they were manipulated in the Arab Springs. And now they're going to have the people in, in Greece who are doing it really hard already have these massive forest fires. You need money to fight forest fires. Greece doesn't have any money. Astounding. So, um, Kevin, we're approaching the end of the show. We're, we have a minute and a half left, so I think uh, what I'll do is I'm going to thank you for coming in again this week with the Extinction Report, and uh, it's great that we have somebody who, would, who is following what's going on around the world uh, concerning the, the climate change. So, a uh, big thank you from me. And, uh, Sean, would you like to uh, round up? Yeah, no, totally. Uh, thanks a lot, Kevin. It's, uh, I know you've been doing a, a fair bit of work out there as, as an activist, uh, trying to get the word out and uh, um, I, I know you're still awaiting uh, information uh, concerning your your bid to uh, where, where you're thinking of basically uh, becoming a politician uh, with a, an extinction party as a, a PR piece to highlight climate change uh, and I wish you luck with that and I'm sure Jimmy does. So, uh, yeah, excellent. Thank you very yeah. much. Can I, just before I go, can I just draw your attention to one more article that I think that your listeners would like to check out? Sure. Darja Mail, who's the, is the main um, journalist at Truth Out, he brought out a, paper, a, a, a really great article on the 6th of July called Mass Extinction. It's the end of the world as we know it. And I think people should go to Truth Out and check out that article. It's fantastic. It, it talks about uh, Professor Guy McPherson and how much more mainstream his position is becoming every day. Wow. And uh, we have to ask people to uh, check out Guy McPherson on YouTube. Um, uh, you know, obviously choose one of the more recent ones. And, uh, you know, and if you do go on there, check out the comments. There's uh, usually a lively debate going on there. And, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's, he certainly lays down a, a possible scenario which uh, doesn't bode well for us. Uh, and let's hope people wake up and uh, try and uh, do what they can to uh, mitigate and to uh, reverse the trend. Yeah, absolutely. We've got to try and slow this down. So we've got to get the people who are running this country to take their foot off the, off the accelerator. 55 million years ago, there was a 5 degree Celsius rise in average global temperatures that occurred in just 13 years. 13 years, 5 degrees C. We have, we have put this whole planetary chemistry system on steroids. We could very easily be looking at that, and that would be the collapse of the biosphere right before our very eyes. All of that is covered in, in Dar's fantastic article on Truth Out. Okay, and Dar Jamal, yeah, Dar Jamal, I should point out, is an ex-Guardian uh, article. He's done a lot of different uh, stuff uh, concerning, uh, well, a wide range of topics, uh, well worth going to check out. Thanks a lot, Kevin, and we'll Absolutely. see you next week. Look forward to it. Thanks for all your work. All right. And uh, great to have the Extinction Report on yet again uh, for another week. Sean, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I just want to do a correction there. Sure. Uh, he was uh, basically Al, uh, Al Jazeera, not The Guardian. Jar 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 yeah, I think so. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how long to... to right. the so, other... so the next section is going to be, uh, uh, part three, is going to be all to do with the um, kind of Irish section, but it's very much in connection with the climate change report that we've just had, and it's looking at the people behind it. And in particular, we're talking about Shell, and we're talking about successes that, uh, uh, that uh, protesters have had against Shell in Ireland. Uh, which, uh, you know, is not getting a lot of media attention either for some reason, Jimmy, is it? Strange, isn't it? <laughs> it is strange. Uh, but we have lots of interviews uh, that, as we've uh, described in the first part of the show, uh, you'll have, uh, I believe it's going to be one, John Lennon, uh, then we're going to have Donald, and, uh, but we'll, we'll meet you back in part three. Cresce só dinheiro, a ser business.